Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. This is Ukraine War News Update, first part thereof for the 27th of November 2024. I woke up this morning, as I do every morning, crack of dawn, as partner and kids go to school, uh, uh, early doors. And I wonder often whether I'm going to have the enthusiasm in the day to continue doing this, as I do every single day. I, I, in my mind, I wake up and think, oh, I'm exhausted. I haven't had enough sleep. I'm not. I'm not sure that I've got the kind of energy within me with my progressive multiple sclerosis. That's always like chipping away as well. And then I start doing my research on my phone in bed, and I just get enthused <laughs> straight away and thinking, oh, I've got to tell the guys this. I've got to tell everyone this. I've got to tell the team that. Like blah 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 blah. blah. And then here we are. Uh, anyway. I'm going to do a live later as well with Greg Terry. So for those who have, have been waiting for a live and done a live for ages, uh, that should happen today at four o'clock UK time in the afternoon. But um, yeah, I am, I'm up and down at the moment psychologically with what's going on in Ukraine. And actually there are elements, I was speaking to Pierre about this, there are elements about what's going on in Ukraine that you could bring us down, like the whole Trump thing is potentially catastrophic, but actually potentially also just a really significant change that has actually expedited Europe going, okay, we've got this, potentially, you know, if, if it happens. So there's a lot of rhetoric of, of Europe stepping up. There's a lot of rhetoric of, of other nations, like uh, by Europe, I, I include the UK. Um, and then you've got potentially South Korea playing an important part. Uh, and then you've got the arms industry in Ukraine getting an awful lot of investment so they are being able to stand on their two feet more and more you've got to talk about a counter uh, offensive from the Ukrainians which I don't know they've got the personnel for that however if it's going to happen this is a perfect time to start that which is as the Russians have just exhausting themselves they must be exhausting themselves but also they're coming up for an economic um, crisis point and you've got the Trump administration coming in on January the 20th looking to force a negotiation. And if they succeed in that, then if Ukraine are on the offensive at that point, literally at that point, you might have this situation that is that is where Ukraine is looking in a slightly better shape than I was thinking maybe a week ago when it's oh, all doom and gloom. So it's just up and down. And we're going to look at the figures and try and piece this jigsaw together um together uh, so we'll start with the ukrainian general self figures after my uh, long preamble there and we have 1580 personnel loss so that's an incredibly high number again 14 tanks is over the daily average and i think a significant loss and you put that together with 48 troop carrying afvs that's an incredibly high number there so it looks like there's a lot of activity going on on the front lines there is quite a bit of video evidence to suggest that there is uh, quite a bit of activity taking place. The 24 artillery systems is also, I think, uh, well, it's, it's, it's above average, but uh, we have seen all the categories low uh, on certain days over the last week or so. One multiple launch rocket system, one anti-aircraft warfare system, so that's good to see. Uh, certainly anti-aircraft warfare systems um, on the list, 84 vehicles and fuel tanks is a very high number in that category, and then four pieces of special equipment. So I think, as far as the loss list today is concerned, pretty good for the Ukrainians. We'll look at Andrew Perpetua's list uh, from the 25th, so with 27th now, so sort of day, day and a half ago. Here, the losses he could identify for the 25th, 97 personnel. Um, which gives, gives you an idea. We have seen days where that's been over 200 odd, um, but that is getting up to the 100 mark. And there were many days of sort of 60, 70. And I think that shows about 100 personnel loss on, on the video feeds. And again, this is very macabre and these are, these are human beings. We must remember that. But from a statistical point of view, I think that that is showing that, that the losses are pretty high. Um, that tracks with what we're seeing with the general staff to some degree. Okay, uh, in terms of losses overall, I think that's about two and a half times uh, a ratio of about two and a half to one Russian to Ukrainian losses. In terms of combat assets, you can see it's about a two to one there. So somewhat good for the Ukrainians. Okay, 
we have a counter battery radar for the Ukrainians there. Now that's not always like a huge bit of kit. Sometimes it's just a small um, uh, appendage, if you like, to a Humvee or whatnot. So uh, without looking into that one, I'm not 100% sure. Some uh, a range of artillery pieces there. Uh, a range of tanks, five tanks, but none of them. They're all Soviet era tanks. Three IFVs, all damaged. One Bradley, two BMPs, so that's not too bad. APCs, we've got a captured VAB, probably up in the Kursk region. There's about eight APCs there, half of them, just over half of them destroyed, uh, abandoned or captured. Uh, mainly M113s and a few other bits and pieces thrown in. And some MRAPs there, four MRAPs, half of them destroyed and that and or abandoned and quite a few civilian vehicles for the ukrainians today pickup trucks suvs and whatnot okay for the russia so nothing too serious for the ukrainians for the russians they have a an air defense system destroyed truck related to the s400 but unsure which so that is a that would be part of that s400 that was taken out or we hear several things like two launchers one radar but i've not seen the pictures of the launchers I've seen the pictures of the radar that's been taken out, which is probably why you've got radar here, uh, 92N6E radar, and then just an, a, a truck related to the S400, but, but you know, is it a launcher? Who knows? Um, a recovery vehicle also, and an engineering vehicle. Then with the artillery pieces, we've got another MTLB with those rocket launchers on top, um, the RBU 6000. I think they're the anti-submarine rockets that, that they've... Uh, appended to the MTLB and tanks we've got about 10 tanks here a um, bit of a range of tanks uh, the T90Ms that have been appearing on the loss list I didn't show you because unfortunately I can't really show you uh, but I suppose I could take the screen grabs but there's a T90M that had an absolutely phenomenal turret, turret toss in the last couple of days it just went up right into the cosmos um, incredible. Uh, we haven't seen that for some time. Uh, infantry fighting vehicles you can see here, and that sort of tracks potentially with, well, maybe what we saw two days ago for the uh, general staff. But you've got about 20 infantry fighting vehicles here. Um, the majority of them destroyed and abandoned. All the usual culprits, BMP1s, 2s and 3s, and, uh, and some other uh, ones as well. Actually, no, just one BMD. I think the rest are BM BMPs. Um, and then APCs, about a uh, half dozen APCs and MRAPs uh, and AFE type things. So uh, all of those destroyed and abandoned pretty much uh, by one. So uh, the Russians losing quite a lot of kit on this particular loss list. Then you've got your trucks and just ATVs and civilian vehicles. Interesting that trucks are still featuring to some degree. Every day there seems to be at least a half dozen trucks uh, as well. We went through a period of not really seeing any trucks get taken out, and now we are again, as I've mentioned previously. And uh, yeah, ATVs, so quads and golf buggies, and a lot of civilian vehicles, a lot of motorcycles on the list today, are both destroyed and damaged, and we even have a battle loaf whatever that is. So that's a Scooby-Doo van that looks a bit uh, like it's been uh, adapted for war more. Okay, now The Economist has had a stab at trying to estimate the number of, uh, of dead on either side, the killed in action. As Max24 says, The Economist's most recent estimate published July the 20, uh, in 2024 said that 106,240, although it's going back to July, uh, I don't know if that's published then or coming out now to, but estimating it as of or up to July 2024, said that between 106 and 140,000 Russian troops have died as of June the 21st, right? So, goodness me, we considering we've had the, maybe the worst two months for the Russians in the last two months, then that number is going to be considerably conservative. At least 60 to 100,000 Ukrainian soldiers have died so far uh, as the uh, Ukrainian equivalent 400,000 are too injured to fight, they say. These numbers do not include civilian deaths. Um, and there you go. So the, there's a few infographics there, a few people talking about these numbers. Um, killed or injured. So intelligence officials ha have a higher number than US officials. No, no, what the difference between US officials and intelligence. And then obviously you've got the time on the x-axis here. So you know, back back in 2022, you had a Pentagon leak to suggest, yeah, I, I, 
if you if you look at these the pink trajectory that's probably somewhat consistent you've got us officials different from intelligence officials not too sure about that maybe you the us here is is pretty consistent there actually if you draw that line um but yeah other than that you know some of them are all, all over the shop um in terms of killed um intelligence officials saying uh 80 to 100,000 uh round about nowish i don't i don't it's so difficult i'm often asked you know how many people do i think have have perished and it's just so difficult you kind of i don't know it, 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 we can make these um these guesses but we we got, we've got to be aware of our own wishes so the wishful thinking fallacy what we want to be true are, are we giving confirmation to those uh, a bias to those that appear higher for the russians than they are for the ukrainians uh, we are going to have so many biases operating and we don't really know uh, and indeed i've argued before that even the intelligence services from other countries aren't particularly then they're not going to be massively more knowledgeable than or they won't be more knowledgeable than the ukrainians because they'll be largely depending on the ukrainian claims for those numbers you don't like i've said before many times you you're not going to have an american pentagon official walking around the battle or like a thousand of them walking around the battlefields with clipboards going yep there's another one add that to the tally there's another one okay uh, you know counting up dead bodies they are broadly doing their analyses from abroad so they are going to be yes they'll have access to satellite imagery uh, uh but really the ukrainian claims are going to be what they're they're going to be basing their estimates on i would think so it's whether they have an ability to fact check the ukrainian claims the general staff figures i've been arguing over the course of this war that the general staff figures are largely correct they're certainly correct with the trends whether the exact numbers are correct uh, i you know i hardly ever tell you what the totals are for the personnel loss because i i just you know when it includes killed wounded pows and deserters and uh, knowing what the ratio within that that overall number is you know not knowing that ratio it's very difficult to say how many people i think have died i think when it comes to stuff like tanks and ifvs i think we've got a, a better understanding given that there's an awful lot of visual confirmation of that in a, in a way that you're less likely to get visual confirmation of personnel dying because as i've said before although you know it's it's really useful that andrew um tots up the the personnel deaths there's going to be a huge difference between that number and reality because he's not going to be able to, able to count up who's inside an ife when it's blown up right or who's inside some barracks when that's hit with storm shadows and, and whatnot so the that's very very difficult to get a, an accurate understanding of from visual confirmation whereas with tanks and ifes and whatnot you there's an awful lot of footage and then there's satellite imagery that you can look at and you're always going to miss stuff but they're getting i think better and better at uh at getting a a decent understanding of what equipment is lost so yeah I, I don't know is the simple answer to how many have died. What I have said previously, and I'll stick with this, is that I'm fairly sure that the Russians are losing considerably more than the Ukrainians. But then the question, well, what does considerably more mean? What What's a quantification of that? It's, again, really difficult to say. A Swedish volunteer, Petrik, 36, was killed fighting Russian forces in Ukraine. A former member of the Swedish Armed Forces with two tours in Afghanistan and a mine-clearing expert, he joined Ukraine's International Brigade, saying this is not right, I can do something. And, you know, very sad when we see, well, anyone uh, perish in this war, uh, especially those fighting for what is good and right. Now, it's worth mentioning that James from Why, uh, Why Ukraine, um, from the YouTube channel, and I've had him on uh, Why in Ukraine, uh, many times he is he has joined up not with the international legion but with a with another group he's been living in ukraine for some time now uh just good luck to him i've been in contact with him a couple of times and he's actually still posting on the threads occasionally i think he's involved with with drone 
um, with a drone unit, but I don't know what I can say. I don't really know that much, to be honest. So anyway, good luck to him. As a result of a attack and strike on the command post in the Kursk region of on November the 20th, Lieutenant Colonel of the Russian Armed Forces Alexander Nikolaevich uh, Gubzov was eliminated, is the claim here. Uh, there are very many claims about that strike, as I mentioned, you know, p potentially 500 perishing in that strike. And in fact, you're seeing this now get through to the mainstream media, Financial Times reporting about that North Korean general was injured and several officers uh, sent by Pyongyang to Russia's Kursk region were also killed last week. Um, storm shadow in that storm shadow strike. So, um, yeah, uh, what else to say? Besides the storm shadow attack, Ukraine has launched several strikes targeting North Koreans in Kursk region over the past week. Ukrainian forces are actively searching for more positions where the North Koreans are present. Uh, thousands of North Korean soldiers are now being deployed from staging grounds to Russia's second line, freeing up more of Moscow's own 50,000 strong force for combat with the Ukrainian troops, according to senior officials in Kiev. Uh, North, Korean, North Korea has delivered 62 domestically made 170 mil, 170 mil sorry, M1989 self-propelled how howitzers, 62, and 62 updated 240 millimeter multiple launch rocket systems. Wow. So that's up from 50 and 20. That's now 62 and 62. That's 124 pieces of kit according to ukrainian intelligence shared with the financial times that's up from 15 20 yeah respectively when i reported it two weeks ago that is what i've warned about because as soon as the north koreans um start providing russia with like seriously large amounts of kit and personnel then you've got a, a prolonging of the war and an attrition that you know ukraine don't have the parallel to that there's no analog that they have of being able to get hold of twelve thousand people just like that now there are many nations providing kit for ukraine but it's been really important to see the russian stockpiles get depleted and then think right they're exhausted this is going to be a key moment and as soon as they they can get hold of of more stuff in numbers like that and it doesn't have to be the best stuff it, it's just they'll throw it into the mixer and it'll invariably get attrited but that's work that the ukrainians have, have to do and they will lose people and equipment on account of that north korean stuff and the, those north korean troops being there it is not good for ukraine and that's why i think it's a game changer if it happens at scale from the north koreans um yes uh anyway uh let's move on now in terms of uh equipment loss losses this is a really interesting uh statistic another nalcio tot up so the last one um i presume we looked at this yeah so this was three weeks ago so the last kursk sorry losing my voice the last kursk uh tot up was three weeks ago uh now in the last three weeks the summary from visually confirmed losses has the ukrainians losing 22 so that's basically one a day it's not too bad the russians losing 80 so that is essentially four a day. Uh, so that is a four to one loss ratio, pretty much. Uh, that is exactly what the Ukrainians would want, but also shows that the Russians are in attack mode in Kursk. Uh, the Russians losing, uh, let's have a look, a lot of APCs here, um, infantry fighting vehicles and APCs. Um, it's mainly that actually, Some uh, a few bits of artillery, not really any tanks uh, apart from a couple at the top there. But yeah, a huge number of infantry fighting vehicles, and that shows that they are uh, attacking those Ukrainian lines, getting to those tree lines, disembarking a uh, number of troops, uh, as we see quite often. Uh, but quite often those columns get hit, hit and destroyed before they get there. And in fact, we've got another example of this, although this is Chesif Yar. Here we have the 24th Mechanized Brigade successfully repelling a large mechanized um russian assault near the canal in chesif yard destroying seven bmd4s in the process most vehicles were eliminated through remote white mining so th things like remote mining and drones ukraine don't have the personnel to be able to trip these um these columns of vehicles and personnel when they get to the contact line so the flot the flot they need to make sure that these vehicles are getting destroyed in transit 
and and that's why the drones and mines are so so important where ukraine start losing is when you when they lose that buffer zone so you look down in the Kur Kurakova area and they're there the they're fighting street to street that buffer zone has been lost they are less able to have all these drone crews taking out these columns of people as they're attacking over the no man's land and into ukrainian controlled territory that that's been lost it's been the ukraine has been overwhelmed there and it's all that everyone's fighting with each other you know there is very little uh, gray zone if you like and, and that's where the ukrainians lose because they have to be attriting the russians man to man um but yeah where where the ukrainians are successful is when they do stuff like this use mines and and drones to take out entire columns of vehicles okay uh, here, I just thought I'd throw this one in. Awkward. Russian sources today actively spread a video of, of where they were claiming two Ukrainian tanks that were blown up by mines on a cross front. In reality, they were two T-90M tanks, which is pretty embarrassing, but it's something that we see quite commonly. Jesus wept. <laughs> that's been a long time since that's happened. Ah, uh, that that I visibly jumped there, and uh, can I just say that randomly went off for no particular reason at all. I, was, I wasn't even on that anyway. Ah, uh, the old fight with the music. Yes, I know how to mute tabs. You don't have to tell me. I love this. I love this fight. I lost today, but my goodness, I'll win in future. Uh, Ukrainian soldiers reported those Russian T ninety M losses and published vi uh, photos of those on the twenty third of November near Selodove. On the cross front so as mentioned we have seen the, the ukrainians do that uh, a number of times before now i was asked about this recently like where are the pv pvv 302s these are the swedish um bangsvan the swedish apcs essentially that have been given to the tune of uh, at least a couple of hundred i think or, or maybe around the 200 mark uh, there are different numbers touted but yeah, these have been sent to Ukraine. We know they're there now, uh, but we haven't really seen them. Uh, this is the first loss of one. These were uh, went out of service in 2014, but they're still uh, pretty decent bits of kit. Uh, Andrew Perpetua says, is this a PVV-302? It's the first one. I, if so, it's the first one I've seen. Uh, if it's not, then I don't know what it is. It does look like it could be. This looks like an abandoned one um, that's obviously run uh, a mark um uh, you know, come across a mine or something sure looks like uh one doesn't it so yeah it's got those hatches on top as well uh yeah definitely seems to me to be one okay Atesh partisans have destroyed a relay cabinet in the village of Alexivka in Kherson region disrupting the railway in the Nova uh Nova Alexivka to Melitopol section it's a railway line that supplies Russian troops to the Zaporizhia region so good news there right we're going to go on to hits and sorry strikes distant strikes and there's been quite a lot happening overnight possibly some huge strikes by the Ukrainians on the Russians we shall see now, 89 drones, another massive wave of drones uh, sent into Ukraine. Looks like a really good interception rate, though. 36 of them shot down, 48 locationally lost, so that's 70, 84. And then five flew off in the direction of Russia uh, into Belarus, uh, or Russia or Belarus, and uncontrolled territory. So that's 100% interception rate. Uh, that's excellent news there. Now, yesterday, Sumi was hit. Uh, a number of times, Sumi, which is hit uh, by Russia earlier, said Tim White yesterday. One person was filming the first hit when something else fell from the sky. Looks like part of a downed object just fell onto the road there. Incredible. Um, and this is what a parking lot in Sumi looks like after Russia hit it. And the city today, nearby windows of broken high-rise buildings. There was fire in one apartment. Also, the roof of the kindergarten was damaged. 30 key, 38 kids were sheltering at the time. Uh, yeah, thanks thanks for that, Russia. That is, I guess, liberation, right? This Is this what liberation looks like? 38 carrying children in a, in a kindergarten. Yeah, nice. Thanks, Russia. Sumi was hit, apparently, with a tornado multiple launch rocket system, likely using phosphorus incendiaries, says the Sumi District Council Deputy Head uh, Bitsak. 
Now, we have, I don't know whether this is the MLRS that is your basic MLRS. The, the, there are two different, there's a Tornado G, Tornado S. One of them is the equivalent to a high Mars that actually has a longer range than a high Mars, but we've not seen them be used throughout the war, predominantly one assumes, because the they don't have the munitions for them. Um, so it'd be interesting to to know what um, uh, what version of the tornado that would be. Now the Kiev Independent reports a Russian missile attack uh, on that residential building uh, actually left two people dead uh, and the residential building and the kindergarten. Um, so that is sad news there. And we also see, I mean, there's there's a lot I could report on, lots of sort of strikes and hits around Ukraine yesterday by the Russians. Uh, Tim White says, yesterday Russia sent drones to attack a humanitarian aid point in Zaporizhia region with the war criminals' drones hitting a bread van delivery, uh, delivering bread to civilians in the frontline villages, virtually cut off by the fighting. The driver was injured and taken to hospital. I mean, just complete... <sighs> I don't mean to swear, but complete bastards. Um, yeah. On the other hand, Ukraine undertook a massive attack, by the sounds of it, last night on Crimea, on Belbek Airfield. Uh, talk of a number of places being targeted, Sevastopol as well. Confirmed by major sources around 40 drones, Neptune missiles, possibly Storm Shadow missiles being involved. Russian channels were panicking as debris was hitting targets. Now here we have a number of Russian sources saying we wait 15 minutes and give the all clear to the drones uh, over Crimea as Sevastopol. If there are no more targets, uh, we maintain the danger of drones in Crimea. There will be a third wave, so this is understanding that there were there were at least two waves, possibly three. Yep, uh, the third drone wave, the third drone attack we expect launches of Neptune anti ship missiles, ballistic missiles, and storm cruise missiles. Say these Russian sources at the time. So a really considerable attack on Crimea. We don't know yet what the damage was, but certainly Belbek Airfield seems to have been targeted. According to Russian reports, Crimea is under combined attack by drones and missiles this morning. Explosions have been reported in Sevastopol, as well as strikes on Belbek airfield. Now, alongside of that, there were strikes last night, uh, yesterday evening, um, in Rostov, I believe, and fairly, fairly large ones by the sounds of it. Russians report very powerful explosions in Rostov and Don. So remember, you've got Berdyansk, Mariupol, Taganrog, and then Rostov and Don um, along the kind of northern coast of the Azov Sea and then go further to the east. Uh, that could be as a result of Ukraine having access to more missiles, but also possibly starting to utilise, as we heard potentially in Crimea, their Neptune missiles to a greater degree. Now, this was during the rounds yesterday, but I don't know what happened in the end. It's quite a big explosion, quite a big fire over there in the distance. Now, the initial report was in the city of Salavat in Bashkiria. There, it was an alarm due to unknown drones. The likely target was a Gazprom oil and gas infrastructure about 1,400 kilometers from the front lines. Okay, so you've got flames, you've got smoke by the looks of it media reported that drones were reportedly attacking the gazprom neftkin salavat refinery in bashkiria russia it turned out to be a civil an-12 plane flying in restricted area after russia air defense engaged it an-2 not an-12 so an an-2 plane now actually oh there, there is footage of the plane it, yeah this is it here so <laughs> Yeah, they're still firing. Yeah, they're still firing. And there looks to be flames and smoke already. Uh, so I don't know. And anyway, there's another video. So that's what it would look like. Um, fairly substantial refinery by the looks of it. There's a video of an actual plane flying over. Is that it there? Yeah, that's it there. So we've already got... got and there's, there's video of it closer as well. It... So it's either a plane or it's one of these planes that have been made into a drone. Um, in which case, uh, you know, if you if you if you are flying a dr a plane that close to a refinery in a restricted area where there's air defences, you are insane. I've talked about this previously, where I was like, I would not want to be a small 
plane pilot in you know a hobby pilot in Russia these days like as soon as I'm up in the air I'm thinking am I going to be shot down like how are there any refineries near here any oil depots because I am target number one because I look just like a drone a lot of these drones that go a long distance into Russia look just like small airplanes or indeed are effectively small airplanes that have been uh, converted into drones and so it seems bizarre that you would have an AN2 flying over a refinery, but it, it seems that most people were, were claiming in the end that this was uh, a a plane that was just shot down near a refinery. But I don't know. Uh, there's something that doesn't quite add up there with already existing um, explosions and, and flames and whatnot. Uh, media reported that drones were reportedly attacking the gas bomb left Kim Salavat refinery. It turned out to be, yeah, as mentioned, that AN2 plane. Right, okay. Moving on, so there, there might be news coming out from there, but certainly should be news coming out from Crimea and potentially Rostov Oblast as well. Um, now, uh, talking about those drones that get spoofed, uh, Le Monde, a uh, French newspaper, has reported that Ukraine is using electronic warfare to change the coordinates of the Shahid drones and send them back to Russia and Belarus. This is a result of spoofing, uh, interception of satellite coordinates. One of the theories, I haven't read the Le Monde piece, but one of the theories was that they were these shahids were using ukrainian sim cards uh so they had a sim card on, on board the drone that would then use masts to mobile phone masts to triangulate where it was because each mobile phone mast has a code and it it could use that to fly itself around to then hit a target so what the ukrainians have supposedly been doing or possibly been doing is changing the codes in the mobile phone masks that then confuse the shaheds that are using them to triangulate and that sense and if you change the codes in a way that you can predict that that you can you can make those drones fly then on up to the north uh, and it could be that's how they're doing it but but i don't know anyway the le monde reporting on the spoofing there as we are seeing more and more of these drones uh, fly. In fact, the Belarusians said that there were uh, there was a record number in 24-hour period of 38, which is far more than the Ukrainian general staff have been claiming. But one of the groups in Belarus has said we've had 38 drones flying over Belarus in 24 hours. So it certainly appears to be working. Now, uh, moving on to other bits and pieces. Uh, Ukrainian forces pushed Russian troops back uh, near the approaches to Kupiansk, I think that's interesting. So that's the Oskil River, where apparently they've got across the Oskil River. For the second day in a row, heavy fighting rages as Ukrainian soldiers repel Russian attacks, including from the Oskil River. But the the actually pushing them back is apparently what's happened in Kupiansk. So you know that you've got Kupiansk, Svatova, and Kremina, that, that town or city in the north, Kupiansk that is split by the Oskil River. On the, on the right-hand side of that, the eastern side of that Oskil River, you've had this, uh, supposedly, this bridgehead of Russian troops that's got into Kupiansk. Apparently, they have been pushed right back. Um, so that's good news. Um, but it's, it's looking pretty desperate down in the south in the Kurakova direction and Velika Novosilka. So then it's fascinating that you hear this. So Sirsky announced that the the commander-in-chief, announced uh, yesterday, I think it was, a new counteroffensive of the armed forces. Quote, We have to stop the enemy, but victory is impossible if the armed forces work only in defence. We have to seize the initiative and counterattack. We have and we will. You'll see where and who. This is a fascinating. On the one hand, Ukraine desperately need troops down in that southeastern corner. And this was a situation when Prokrosk, well, Prokrosk is still falling at a rate of knots, certainly in that kind of southwesterly direction from that large salient near um, near Avdivka. Now, when that was at the most worrisome, the Ukrainians did a counterattack and they didn't support defending, sending their troops in to defend Pokrovsk. And I argue, and I still do argue, I did argue that this was a correct, correct move from Ukraine because if they'd just thrown those troops into t defending, they would not have gained the initiative anywhere and all they would do would would be to slow down the advance around Pokrovsk, use up all of those decent troops to slow down an advance 
rather than take even more ground than they were losing up in Kursk, which was the least defended area. No minefields and fortifications, or at least if they were, they weren't particularly manned and they were fairly sparse compared to the entire Ukrainian front line. So Ukraine were able to take the initiative off the, the Russians, which is you're not going to win if you are always on the defensive. If you're just going to sit there and defend, you, it's like a game of football. If you, yeah, okay, we're not going to, we're not going to allow them to score any goals. We're not going to concede any goals. But you can't score if you've got eleven people behind a ball in your penalty area, right? So at some point you're going to have to go on the attack if you want to win the game. So the the Ukrainians need to attack somewhere rather than just perpetually defend, whilst also de having enough troops to defend adequately. So there's the, there's an optimal point, there's a sweet spot. Maybe they got it wrong with Pacross with the, the southeast. You can argue that, but it's interesting if they do have some people they've kept in reserve, like the Anne of Kiev. Uh, unit that's been trained up in France and other other units being trained maybe in the UK and elsewhere I would would have thought they're going to attack north of the border somewhere because that to me is the most sensible place to do that for the same reasons as we discussed before or whether this is kind of psyops and Sersky really doesn't have the troops to be able to do that now uh just want to mention this comment Anna Martins says Jonathan it's a little surprising that a guy so nuanced and open-minded like you well thank you for that seems to uh, be stuck on the idea that it will take Russia a very long time to get back on their feet so I've talked about how it will be a generation before they are uh, operating the way they are now if they if they get a good deal in Ukraine and if the sanctions are lifted and they start doing billions again so I guess getting from hydrocarbons and if the 300 billion are given back the economy will bounce back yeah I don't deny that but I just don't think that's going to happen like 300 billion won't be given back unless the Russians use that to pay reparations and I don't know that I don't think certainly the EU won't lift sanctions like that unless something absolutely fundamental happens like there's a regime change or or Russia pull fully out of Ukraine. So I, 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 you're saying that they will bounce back quickly if these things happen. Yeah, I just don't agree that those things will happen. They already have the Russian public mindset ready for a war effort and factories assembled and know-how, the real combat experience and the connections with other countries. Yeah, but have you seen how much stuff has been destroyed and how many people have been killed? Like if... You will have some battle-hardened troops, but it, but you don't have the elite troops. You, you don't have the resources that they did at the beginning of the war. They have absolutely chomped. They will need to basically manufacture their entire um, fleet of T-90s and uh, infantry fighting vehicles from scratch again and train up all the people to use them. You know, they are using people that they were... The Ukrainians are capturing people that have been trained up for three days. Okay, so I think the Russians have been fundamentally attrited and degraded, uh, certainly in their conventional um, ground forces. And I think it will just take them a long time. Now, we can debate whether that's, you know, 10 years or, or more. But I, I honestly, you know, there, there is this question about... We'll come on to this in a second, actually, because this is what um, Ryan Macbeth talks about. So you keep assuming that the next war the Russians fight will be like this one, and most likely it will be not. Uh, we won't prepare for a full-on war in Ukraine. These meat assaults and Russian are uh, Russian tradition, but more than that, right now they are made out of necessity and urgency in time. If they have the time, they will do better and remember that now they have the, the drones that they didn't care before and also the missiles and the real combat experience. They still have most of their air force. Apparently their air force is in a less decent shape than you would think and most of their navy uh, they can fight different next time the army can be reconstituted in a few years i don't i just simply don't agree with this for a whole number of reasons i won't go into it fully now but we will dip into it to a degree in it with the last thing i'm going to show you now ukraine itself will not seat the russians at the table without trump nothing will work here Trump does not really have a plan to end the war, and now he is receiving various secret information, according to Ukrainska Pravda, citing sources in Zelensky's team. And this is fascinating. I've talked about this before. Watch out for this, because I, I, one of my hopes for the Trump administration coming in, so I've got two hopes. One is that he gets really transactional and is convinced that Ukraine is to, supporting Ukraine is to his benefit, personal benefit. Like it's to US's benefit, but really US is him. He is the US and anything that is good for the US is, it has to be good for him, for, for Trump. And so 
if he's convinced that way, then if it's good for him, then it's good, then he'll help Ukraine. Now, there's one hope that that might happen and he gets behind Ukraine. The other hope is this. I've said this a number of times. He could get in or his team could get in and they are then privy to intelligence that suggests that Ukraine supporting Ukraine is absolutely necessary. There are things they might be told that we don't know. Like you do realize if we don't support you, we couldn't tell tell you this. We couldn't announce this in public, but come into the Pentagon, speak to intelligence. It turns out that we absolutely 100% have to support Ukraine. And here's why. And it could be that there's enough intelligence in there that will change people's minds because you've got a lot of like MAGA Republicans going, oh, why are we spending this money? Do you, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So the, the Americans are sending that money to Ukraine because it's in their best interest to do so. And that rationale might, that it's in our best interest, might be largely dependent on secret intelligence that people outside of the administration do not have access to or have not had access to. And in so taking the reins of the US, uh, of the US, the new administration might end up changing their mind. And this is this is interesting. I, I would like to see the Ukrainska Pravda because Max 24 sometimes isn't the greatest at, at synopsizing, summarizing these. So Trump does not really have a plan to end the war. I don't think so. I don't think he really does. He's got this basic idea of like, if you don't come to the table, we won't give you this. And if you don't come to the table, we won't give you that or we won't do this or whatever. But then, you know, what's the actual plan going to look like? And uh, what happens if both both of them don't come to the table? Um, and, you know, at the moment, both sides have said that they're not ready to negotiate. Both sides have said that. Um, so and now he is receiving various secret information. Uh, I think it's going to be fascinating, fascinating to see how that plays out. Right. A little bit not so long today on the Russian economy. The ruble is tanking still 108.7. Wow. It just keeps getting worse. And that's good news for Ukraine. Uh, negative 3% every day now, says Jay and Keith. It seems to be consistently tanking. And perhaps the Russian Central Bank has just lost the ability to be able to control that. Uh, Tim White says, well, fancy that Russia is critically short of police. Actually, not many get sent to die in Ukraine, but it all adds up. And with fewer males around, recruitment is tricky. In some districts, shortages are 90 percent. Bigger factors are wage cuts and freezes despite rampant inflation. So going back to that previous point from this commenter, and thank you very much for that, by the way. Uh, it, it may be you're disagreeing with me, but I wouldn't shut that down. I absolutely love that. Let's have a discussion you know, let, let, let's talk about this. But when you start looking at all these bits of the jigsaw, like the 90% short of police in some districts, you're like, okay, how does Russia bounce back from this? They need people. When you look at the demographics, short of getting mass immigration, they don't have the demographics to get those people to replace all the dead and injured people. They don't have the welfare state at the moment to afford paying for all those injured people and, and, and the welfare required. They are in a bad bad place and if they you know this is assuming if they can bounce back quickly that's assuming the economy can bounce back absolutely quickly but we're going to talk about how that is not going to happen um so anyway the, the tanking the ruble is is meaning that that actually some of these big wages aren't as as attractive as they once were so migrants are now leaving russia apparently salaries are no longer attractive the russian recon, uh, the russian construction industry is facing a shortage of 300,000 workers the reasons are the 20% fall in the ruble in 3 months which makes salaries less profitable so people are going to russia to earn money to send back home and th that your money the ruble has tanked that much then it's there's no point in you going to live in russia to send your money home you might as well go back and, and get a job back at home nearer your family. Uh, so, and then put on top of that, a tightening of immigration laws. You know, they've had the, the issues of the, um, is it Tajiks from Tajikistan with the um, terrorist uh, atrocities at the uh, Crocus City Hall place, etc., etc. State Duma experts are already recording a massive outflow of foreign labour. 
Okay, then we've got Anton Gerashchenko saying Russian Sukhoi Superjet 100 that ignited in Turkey over the weekend may soon be grounded permanently. So you've got a grounding of the entire fleet due to serious design flaws, making its continued operation increasingly unsafe. Russian sources report repeated failures of critical systems like autopilot, hydraulics and air conditioning have led to numerous in, um, incidents. Rostec blames the human factor, but the near fatal crashes have become too systemic to overlook. In Antalya, a minor overload during landing caused the rear landing gear to puncture the fuel tank and the plane caught fire. Rostec says the pilot is at fault. Allegedly, he did not account for the wind during the landing, but in fact, Russian telegram channels reported there was a failure of the autopilot systems. Last February, a plane rolled off the landing strip at Saransk and only cold weather prevented another fire due to a puncture of the fuel tanks. In July, a repaired superjet crashed shortly after takeoff due to incorrectly installed speed, speed sensors, allegedly a worker's mistake. Despite years of development, the superjet relies heavily on foreign components and the rollout of a domestically produced version has been delayed until at least 2026 with safety risks mounting and maintenance costs soaring, Russian airlines are reportedly seeking to replace the superjet with second-hand Western aircraft, cheaper, safer, and more reliable. Okay, again, it's all these bits of the jigsaw. Um, it seems that even Russian military bloggers are starting to feel uneasy that when they see the exchange rate of the ruble before long, even the huge salaries for military personnel might turn into mere pennies. Um, of course, uh, so, um, this is one Russian mill blogger. It all makes sense. The interest rate sharply increased and people rushed to deposit all their savings in banks. How can these deposits be guaranteed to be repaid with interest? There's an effective option. Devalue them. That is a devaluation. Deposit interest rates in high banks are now at 23% per annum and higher high yields. But there's one catch. As of January the 10th, 2023, the dollar exchange rate was 70.3 rubles. Today, it's already 105 to 108. That's over 50% loss for us. Um, and uh, will it be possible to return this amount to the deposit? Yeah, all of these questions to do with you know what you do with your money, how much your money is worth. It is it is looking bad for the Russians. Now, meanwhile, the Russian uh, information spaces, like their um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and their propagandists, are talking more about the Ereshniks. So that's the in, uh, intermediate range ballistic missile that was sent into Dnipro. Uh, aren't they effing tired of Ereshnik, says Dmitry from War Translator. For a week now, it's either the bunker grandpa or his henchmen parroting the same stuff. They have nothing else left. The rate of their advance, despite colossal losses, is historically insignificant. The economy is in a shambles and it's obvious to everyone. They've always threatened with nuclear weapons, but so blatantly only recently. This is a very telling of their situation. So another indicator that things are going terribly behind the scenes economically speaking is that their their um obsession with talking about this missile in public because that's all they've got is saber rattling right okay then we go and again this is kind of answering this this comment to, to a degree this is ryan Macbeth, and we're just going to play this short video from him why can't russia actually stop fighting in ukraine let me show you a newsweek article that actually gets the premise wrong former army colonel daniel davis said ukraine must accept that they cannot win the war against russia and he then goes on to say that Ukraine needs to negotiate. But here's the problem. You can't negotiate if the other side doesn't want to negotiate. And Russia right now can't afford to stop the war. As of right now, unemployment in Russia is running at 2.4%. Just about every single person in Russia is either fighting in the war or making material for the war. So what happens if you stop the war tomorrow? You have a heck of a lot of unemployed people. Essentially, you will double your unemployment if you go back to pre-war levels. So you have mass unemployment, and now you have a whole bunch of young people who know how to use a gun and don't have a job. Oh, hold on. I've seen this movie. The fact is, unless President Putin wants to end up like the Ceausescu's, he needs to keep the war going because a bunch of young men who have military experience, know how to use guns, and are unemployed is a bad recipe for a dictator. So if you don't know much about economics, you might say Ukraine can't win this war. Whatever. But you know what? Russia literally can't win this war. Like, they physically can't win this war and suffer the consequences of demobilization. They have to keep the war going. Oh, and hey, you know what can keep you going during the Christmas holiday season? My new A very... <laughs> so, anyway, he goes on to talk about his merch, but it's a really interesting point there that they're forced to continue the war because their entire economy depends now on it. They have one-tracked their economy to be a war economy they have nothing else left the ruble is tanked they've got a labor shortage they've shut down immigration which would be one way to get that that labor up and will or or they are trying to get immigration in maybe 
you know, it's e either they're shutting it down because of terrorist problems or they're trying to get some in, but they, they, they'll be unable to get them because the ruble is tanking so badly that it's not attractive to, uh, to get those uh, workers in. Uh, and, and it's just, it, it's an absolute omni shambles. And I think that, Russia will struggle to bounce back from this. I mean, you can you can say, yeah, they'll get there as soon as they get their um, hydrocarbons becoming, uh, you know, as soon as they get those exports back on track. But, you know, how long will that take? They've got a lot of maintenance that needs to be done. If the West keeps their sanctions up, and th there is a key element there of, of the West keeping sanctions up, say, um, on hydrocarbons uh, maintenance, then Russia are in a lot of trouble for a long time. Now, even Trump, it, Trump's not not so stupid that he would lift sanctions on hydrocarbons maintenance because the US is pumping oil and he wants to drill baby drill. Now, he gets a competitive advantage over Russia if, if the US can keep pumping and maintaining their own uh, ability to do so but Russia is unable to do so due to western sanctions so I, I don't know I just I don't see there being an easy way for Russia to bounce back quickly after this they are they are hooked into this war economy uh, they have got the demographics are not in their favor they are desperate for for children but you know even that's like 18 years time but they are they are not having the children they're killing off their population or maiming them and uh, i i think it's desperate straits for for russia going forward anyway let me know what you think uh, and whether you agree take care and i'll speak to you soon